Good evening to everyone. Uh, we're here back here at the Lighthouse for our Wednesday weekly get together. And this week's lesson is an important lesson for Elul. And it's important lesson this day not only prepares for Elul, but for Rosh Hashanah and for Yom Kippur. And even if somebody doesn't learn all month long what they're supposed to do, I'm hoping to make this lesson encapsulated in such a way that it'll prepare everyone, okay? And uh, Hashem, it's entitled Moving Mountains. And people, they don't think that they have the capability to move mountains. That's sound logical. How could you take a, a big mountain and move it? Well, one of two ways, according to logic, according to nature, you could either use explosives, all kinds of explosives. You could blow up mountains, a little bit chip away at them. Or you could use bulldozers if they're strong enough. But if you don't have that, there's no other logical way. We're not talking about logic. But to preface our lesson, I want to tell you a story that's from the Gesher Chaim. The Gesher Chaim is a famous book. It's called The Bridge of Life. And The Bridge of Life was written by Rabbi Yechiel Michal Tuchachinsky. And uh, it's a big tzaddik from Bnei Brak. And he was also a Torah scholar and also a real Kabbalist. Might have had an imitation. Real. And he wrote all about what happens to the soul when it leaves its life. And it's an amazing book, a three-volume book. And uh, one volume is just halacha, about the, halacha, the halachas of mourning. And it's a classic. It's a classic book. There's no more authority. If someone wants to know what happens to the soul when it leaves this thing, people say, well, I, nobody knows. We do know. Our sages tell us. And uh, Rabbi Tuchachinsky of uh, St. and Blessed Memory, he brought us down. But I'm going to tell one of the stories that he says, I'm going to use it in a modern, change the context a little bit, so it'll be a little easier to, to understand, to digest, okay? Uh, he tells what happens to the soul. When the soul finishes, the soul goes up to the heavenly court. And the heavenly court sounds like it's really scary, and you know, all these accusing angels and whatnot. It's, it describes a little bit differently. You go up to the heavenly court, imagine that you're taken in to a theater and you're on stage and strong, strong spotlights are on you. When you're on stage and dark and strong spotlights, you can't see anything that's going out. You don't see the audience, you don't see who's there. Okay, the spotlights are so strong, directed on you, that you don't see what's going on. So you sit in a chair and even though you wanna move, you can't move, you can't move. You're not in control of your body because your body, it's, it's a, it's not a real body anymore. It's just a clothing. It's a little clothing of light that clothes your soul that looks like your body. Okay, it's, it's something, it's, it's a spiritual clothing. But you're in your, the beginning of your trial and they preface your trial by showing you two movies. You had two movies and you sit there and it's as if you're tied with a straitjacket. You can't even move. Your head has to look at the screen. And while you're looking at the screen, they since chair swivels 180 degrees and you look behind you at the screen and everyone in the audience is looking at that same screen you are and they show a movie of your life from the moment you came into this world to the moment you left and there are no details left out and this is at heavenly speed sometimes accelerated if you live to 120 years it does take 120 years to show that movie that movie takes quicker okay but see everything nothing is left out and for the neshama that's watching this movie, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. There are things that were done behind closed doors and maybe the neshama thinks nobody ever knew about that. Oh yes, the heavenly court knew about everything. Every single detail, nothing left out. And the most embarrassing things and, oh, this, this is the fire of purgatory. The fire of purgatory, have you ever been embarrassed and you feel your face is flush and face on fire, your face turns white and then red. And this is this is the fire of purgatory, the embarrassment. The embarrassment that a neshama has about things it did in this earth. And yeah, it, it's it's too late. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. So that's the first, the first movie. Wow. And you think that's painful. The second movie is much more painful. Now they show you the second movie. The first movie is what you did in your 120 years on this earth. The second movie they show you before that prefaces your trial in heavenly court shows you what you could have done. 
what Hashem gave you the power to do, the power of your soul, what you could have done, whether it's you could have completed all of uh, all of Shas, all of the Talmud, whether you could have found the cure to cancer, whether you could have done, you could build an orphanage, whether you could become a, a rich person and, and a philanthropist, and this is what meant to do. Instead, you wasted your money on another thing. They wasted the show that Hashem gave you powers, unbelievable powers that no one else had. And the powers are wasted. Wow, that is a more terrible embarrassment for the soul and it's painful for the soul. It, it's unbelievable. Okay, now the soul knows this even before, even before it gets up to the heavenly court. It gets up to the heavenly court, it's a scored up to heavenly court. It depends what the soul did, what type of uh, escort it gets up to the heavenly soul, whether it's the very good protective angels or the angels from the other side, not too good. And uh, whether the soul comes escorted with an honor guard or in a ball and chains, it, both, it depends on what the soul did down here. But there's one common denominator of all the souls. The moment. The split second that the moment the soul leaves the body, the soul gives out a scream, this is the Gemara tells us, the soul gives out a scream that could be heard from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. Well, what's a scream? What's the soul saying? The soul says, let me back in. Because the moment, you have to understand, when we are covered with this flesh and blood, physical, material body, what this does is it blocks divine light. It that's why we need a Muna. We need a, to believe in Hashem and to believe that Hashem is with us and to believe this is what the Muna is for. In the next world, you don't need a Muna because everyone does it best, but depending on what the level of the soul is, the basks in divine light. And everybody knows that they, even not only that, in Gehenna and Purgatory, they know more than what we do because everybody knows that Hashem is king and Hashem is the creator and Hashem is everything in Purgatory. In fact, the Gemara also tells us, we're not talking about Zohar, we're talking about the Gemara, we're talking about real Torah. The Gemara tells us that Korach and his buddies are down in Gehenna and they're singing Moshe Emet, Vitorato Emet, with little kids singing in kindergarten. Moshe is truth and the Torah is truth. Because he had a machloket, he argued, he contested Moses' rule, he wanted to rule, and now he's admitted the truth, he knows the truth. So Korach down in Gehenna knows the truth. Korach never comes up, but the, at least the, down in Gehenna forever and ever says a Gomorrah. And this is what he's saying. So we know from this that down in Gehenna, they know what the truth is. People here don't know what the truth is. And the few people that are believers, believe in Amuna, the world looks at them, oh, you're man, too quick, you're out, you're in this. This is not logical. Okay, we're going to talk about logic, about the limitations of logic. Logic is one of the biggest balls and chains that there are in this world because logic is the opposite of the moon. Now, as we, you saw that tonight's lesson is titled Moving Mountains. Okay, what is Moving Mountains? If we use the power that Hashem gave every single one of us, every single one of us has a power to move mountains. We say, well, how can you move mountains? But you know something? When we use our power, our logical power, and our cognizant power, and what we feel is our power's nature, our natural power, that is compared to a little kid with a shovel in the sandbox, okay? Little boy, little girl, the shovel in the sandbox. And our powers that Hashem gives us is compared to a bulldozer. So you can compare what earth, the move, the bulldozer can move the earth, yeah, it moves earth. What the bulldozer can do, and what a little child with a shovel in a sandbox can do. How much can he, how much sand can he move in a, in a minute? Okay, how much can a bulldozer do? This is the complete difference. This is something, uh, a tangible example, so we can understand what our spiritual potential is. So we say the soul, you know, the soul wants to come back. Why does the soul want to come back? Because now, in an instant, the soul sees Hashem. The soul sees Hashem's compassion because there's no more jail. The moment the soul, the moment, the exact split moment, 0 0.00001 milliseconds, that's how fast it takes the soul to see Hashem's light. And we saw the embarrassment in the Torah when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and he says, Ani Yosef. He sends all the Egyptians out 
And he says, they think that they're talking to the viceroy of Egypt. And he says, no, I am Joseph, your brother. I am Joseph that you sold me into Egypt. The brothers are, oh, they're so embarrassed. Well, the Gemara tells us that the embarrassment that the brothers had when Joseph revealed himself, a flesh and blood brother revealed himself. He told Joseph was a great Saudi. But we consider flesh and blood that Joseph compared to that as an angel. Okay. When Joseph, the embarrassment that the brothers had, that is nothing of the embarrassment that the soul has the moment it leaves the body. And Hashem says, Ani Hashem. Just said, Yosef said, Ani Yosef. I am Yosef. When Hashem tells the body, Hashem reveals himself to the soul. The soul leaves the body. And the Shem says, I am a Shem. You see a Shem, your loving father in heaven, and you're caressed, your soul is caressed by this white light, by this divine light. I'm using physical terms, but it, it's beyond physical terms. This pure, pure, pure divine light that is so loving. It's what we call or Sameach. This, this, this light of joy, light of happiness. It's a name, a Yeshiva in Yushalayim named or Sameach. Okay. But, and the soul feels that. The soul said, how could I deny such a God? How could I deny such a beloved father? How could I have, how could I foster one negative thought? How could I accuse Hashem of doing something? And you feel the love and you say, I'm Hashem. And this, Hoshea the prophet says, it says this in chapter five of Hoshea. It says, Hashem says, <laughs> it did everything they but they, they spoke about me lies. Once we spoke about a lie, whenever a person thinks that Hashem is doing something difficult, they don't understand what Hashem is doing. Hashem is doing everything for our best. So what the soul gives the scream about, I want to correct, I want to do tshuva. Now they say, no, time out, the whistle's blown. It's now the, the football game is over, the basketball game is over, the game of life is over. It's finished. It's like a team that's lost by three points. No, we want to have a chance to do another touchdown. No more chance to do another touchdown. The game is over. The clock is out. There's no more time. So when the Shema yells out, it's out of frustration. What we want to do is we don't want to get there. We don't want to get to frustration. And people, why wait to 120 years and have this suffering? Okay, today's lesson, if you listen, you're not going to have that suffering. And it's probably, there's no bigger gift. There's no bigger gift. I, I like when my lessons are, are practical and a gift. I like, I like to bring gifts to people that they can use it. They feel happier. They feel better. And this life and the next life. Okay. It's not to, to, to quote and do this at the sound intelligent. Okay. <laughs> Don't sound intelligent. I just we need to keep eye level. So this is what the moving mountains about. All right. So a person would give anything when he's up there in a heavenly court. And they're showing him that second film to edit the first film, where now he knows what he could have done. Oh, let me edit the first film. No, but that's too late. It's over. You can't do that now. But one thing, beloved brother and sister, we are still alive. We are still here. And that's what they say, Chanel Doleg, as long as the candle is burning. It's a beautiful Yiddish song. Go to Kolo Chanel Doleg. Okay. As long as the candle's burning, we can correct. We can correct. This is the greatest thing in the world. And this is the gift of Elul. This is the gift of Elul. Hashem comes off the heavenly throne in Tishrei. It's hard to get to Hashem. Hashem is on the heavenly throne and he's surrounded by all these hierarchies of angels, the archangels and the Srofim and Ophanim. I'm not even going to go into the different hierarchies of what's going on up in Shemayim. Angel, but now, Hashem is like the king. This is the, the Lubavitch Rebbe used to say this all the time. The king is in the field. This was his expression for, for Elul. The king is in the field. And when the king is in the field, he goes out and he sees the worker and on the field, guy on the field, the king smiles at him. Here's this farmer. How are you going to get to the king and then in the throne and get past all the guards? But now the king comes and sees you. The king goes to the cobbler, the shoemaker, his little shop. And the king says hello to him. The king comes to a, a, a mother when she's cooking dinner for her family. And the king says hello to her. The king is right there with every one of us. He's right here. This is the power of Elul. What we have the power to do this month, we can't do any other time of the year. This is special power of Elul. So instead of waiting until life is over, we're going to edit the film. We can edit it right now. How do we edit it? With one word, tshuva. People don't like the word tshuva because the tshuva, the Yetzirah is given tshuva 
a bad, bad press, bad connotation. Oh, this is, you know, this is, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bal tshuva. We all should be bal tshuva. We all should be in tshuva every day in our life because the Torah says, mitzvah do like shuvu ad Hashem alokecha. Until we reach Hashem, we haven't finished doing tshuva. Until we reach Hashem. So we have to all the time strive to do more and more and more tshuva. Okay. So what do we do? Our sages tell us, shuv yom echad lifnei mutcha. Make tshuva. Tshuva doesn't mean penitence. Tshuva means returning to Hashem. Returning to Hashem. What's returning to Hashem? What is a manifestation of Hashem in this world is Torah, is mitzvahs. That's how we get and fold the light of Hashem. We learn His Torah, we perform His mitzvahs, and that's how we cling to Hashem. Okay, so our sages tell us, make tshuva, be fair, make tshuva one day before you die so that you don't have that embarrassment up in your mind. The person could say, okay, what is it? A silly person, a person with no sense, no common sense, says, ah, I'm still around here. Okay, I'll make tshuva, not today. I remember I was talking to a young man, a young man just finishing university. And he says, uh, Rabbi, how old were you make tshuva? I said, me, it took me 32 years. I was 32. He says, well, you know something? Okay, I'm 24 now. Uh, if it's good for laser road, it's good for me. I'll wait till I'm 32. I said, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that because... Uh, I made shuv when Hashem woke me up. Okay. Hashem waited for me. I didn't wake up myself. I can't take credit for it. Hashem did. Hashem, who, 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 had you made shuv? Hashem did it. Hashem had, had made shuv for me. I, I can't attribute this to myself. And I know Reb Luzer Brizel, Reb Luzer Brizel was one of my first teachers at Big Sadiq in Shalim. He left this world at 102. And when he left this world, he had over 1,000 offspring. He had 14 kids and every one of the every one of the 14 kids they had uh they had at least 10 kids and all those 10 kids had he left the world at a thousand dollars Reb Luzer was a, a tremendous tremendous sadik and when I was a young Baal Shuva, I got close to him and he he taught me quite a bit he told me he said a Baal Shuva cannot attribute to himself the power oh I've got uh spiritual awareness that I'm intelligent and there are another million people of my age and my background that didn't make tshuva, I did tshuva, no, no. That we have tshuva, it's all because of Hashem's compassion. And one thing that helps is when a, a person has a holy great-grandfather, great-grandmother that shakes the heavenly throne, Hashem, please, 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 I want that great-grandson, that great-granddaughter, bring them back into the fold. Okay, so that's that. We can't say, I'm going to do the might of my right hand. No, not, not that. All right, so I told the young man, okay, sir, says, oh, I was 32. But it, it made big problems I, all the time. I wish, you know, it's a thought from Hashem. And I, after the more I learned the Muna, the, the more I, uh, I accepted, learned to accept. But you, 24, you have the chance right now. Do it right now. You get an eight-year head start on me. So if I did what I did, you could do so much, so much more. Don't wait. And it's the same person. I talked to another person, talked to people of all ages, all backgrounds. Another person is 73. The person is 73. And he says, What well, I'm going to do, Chuva? No, I'm going to do Chuva. I said, What do you mean? What are you talking like an old man? I'm only two years younger than you. I do I do Chuva all the time? Change my life all the time? Do everything. All the time look for Shem, all the time look better. Okay, when you say, I'm going to change my life, then you're old. Then you're old. You don't have to old people. Old people have Alzheimer's or dementia. A person that's making tshuva is young because his neshama is young. He stays young. He or she stays young. And the neshama is young and they're vibrant and they're learning. You want to get close to Shem. I promise you, as long as you strive to get close to Hashem all your life, to get closer and closer to Hashem, you're not going to know what Alzheimer's is. You're not going to know what dementia is. You're not going to know what it is. Because your neshama is young and your neshama keeps your body young. That is, it's the greatest thing in the world about tshuva. Okay, so where do we learn that this power of tshuva? What do we talk about tshuva? We can move mountains. So we, we said that logic and our natural ability is like a shovel, a little kid's shovel in a sandbox. And tshuva is the power of a bulldozer to move the earth, to move mountains. Where do we learn this? Where is, okay. First of all,
first of all, a lot of my source material came from the Holy Rebbe Yaakov Yitzchak Rabinovich of Pashischa. It's the Holy Yid, they call him the Helege Yid, the Holy Jew of Pashischa. He's a big Rebbe. His teacher was the Choyze of Lublin, and he eventually broke off from the Choyze of Lublin, and he had a a type of a certain old Hasidic septum in Poland, when according to him, the Hasidic Pope, the Jose of Lublin, he's like the father of Polish Hasidus, but then he had one Talmud, Reb Burim Pasheska, Reb Simcha Bunim, from Reb Simcha Bunim, his Talmud was the Arim, from the Arim came the Ger Hasidim, and from the Heligiyid, they had other strains of Hasidim in, in, uh, in Poland. He was unbelievably intelligent, and he put a big stress on learning, learning, learning. There were other Hasidim that put stress on miracles and doing things. He put stress on learning. It was an intellectual Hasidist. And Holy Giyid, he writes, he brings a Midrash from Breshi. And in the Midrash from Breshi, the angels, they said, Hashem, Hashem, why are you creating man? Angels couldn't understand. We know Hashem created the angels before he created humans. And angels are up, but they've got this divine above nature uh, domain with Hashem, the spiritual domain. And now Hashem, with Hashem's unfathomable modesty, Hashem asked the angels, what do you think about creating man? What do you think about me creating a physical earth? What do you create think about man to inhabit the earth? And Angels ask Hashem, well, what, what's the man about? What's the earth about? And Hashem explains to them, he says, Hashem, what are you going to create man for? You create man, and you give him free choice, Hashem, and you give him a shoma that's a tiny part of you, and you give him the body of an animal. Hashem, he's going to gravitate. The angels don't argue with Hashem. Hashem, he's going to gravitate to an animal. He's going to sin right and left. His neshama has no chance to stand against that, to stand against the body. The body's urges and what the body wants and the body's going to deny you Hashem and the body's going to make him do all kinds of different things and, and you think a, a guy's going to, you know, you give Hashem you give the person that, that urge that, that you want to give him and no way Hashem, why create him? Hashem says, uh, angels you're talking about divine justice. In divine justice you're right because there is no human being that can stand in divine justice was called Midat the Deen. Nobody. Okay, you get nobody, nobody, not even the biggest Sadi. But Hashem said, Who do you think? And why do you think I'm called forgiving? And Hashem said, The 13 Midot, the 13 measures of mercy, the 13 attributes of mercy that we say all during Slichas, we say all during high holidays. Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum, Vechanun, Erech Apaim, Dol Chesed, and Micha the prophet, the prophet Micah, uh, he said this a little bit differently, what we say during the Tashlich prayer, Hashem Erech Apaim. Hashem says, what do you think I'm called, he says to the angels, what do you think I'm called compassionate for? What do you think I'm called forgiving for? Not because of divine justice, because of divine mercy. And Hashem said, because of divine mercy, I am going to create man. Angels, they couldn't answer that. They couldn't, they did, oh, with divine mercy, did something else. So Hashem mitigated the divine justice with mercy. What is the biggest expression of divine mercy? The mitzvah that Hashem put in the Torah, tshuva. You know what tshuva is? Tshuva is on the tshuva is returning to Hashem. Imagine that right before Rosh Hashanah, okay, a person messed up in business. And a person who's got no more credit line, and he owes the bank seven hundred thousand dollars. He owes the credit company sixty thousand dollars. And dot dot dot. He owes this and his unpaid mortgage. You put together, he owes a million dollars. Well, the bank manager calls him, sir, Mr. Goldberg. You're invited to the bank, and you better come. Okay, so he comes. He's got no choice, and he's ready to, to get the right act read to him about the million dollars he owes. And the bank manager says to him, he says, I'll tell you what, I want you to acknowledge all the silly deals you did. I want you to acknowledge all the irresponsibility 
that you did in your financial dealings. I want you to acknowledge everything you did wrong. And the guy says, and, and what? And the bank manager says, if you acknowledge everything you did wrong, then I will wipe away the million dollar debt. You owe no nothing. He says, what? He says, no, no, not only that, not only that, if you do it with all your heart and, and, and you really believe what I'm saying, not just say it to placate me, believe it all your heart, I will credit you in your account $1 million. In other words, not only do you not owe a million dollars, if you do this out of your own free will and you start to think about the foolishness you did and you ask forgiveness from me and you promise not to go back to the same foolishness, do the same stuff again, then I'm going to credit you for a million dollars. So if you just say, I'm sorry, you get the slate wiped clean. And if you come back to Hashem with all your heart, you get a million dollars. Well, it's much, much more than a million dollars. It's much, much more. Do you know what happens? Those two movies we saw, when a person does tshuva, all the embarrassing moments out of the first movie get wiped out, they get erased, they get edited. That's the way to edit that first movie while we're still here alive in this world. It's amazing. You could do, you could be a film editor. You could be, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg of Chuva, and you, you could edit your own film, edit your own film, put it whatever you want. Just make Chuva the embarrassing stuff. Okay, messed up in something really embarrassing. And you think nobody knows about it? Shem knows about it. Okay, Shem, I did A, B, C, and D. Hashem is a loving father. You cannot fathom Hashem's love, you cannot fathom Hashem's compassion and his, uh, his forgiving nature. Hashem forgives everything, but as long as you don't run away from him. Hashem didn't like when Kain tried to run away from him. And Hashem says, Kain, where are you? And Hashem says, and Hashem says, Kain, where's your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? Uh oh, that you messed up on Kain. Because you think Hashem doesn't know, and Hashem says your brother's blood is calling me from the ground. Oh, do you know something? When a person speaks Loshan Hara, have you noticed in recent weeks, we've been talking all the time about Loshan Hara, all the time about Loshan Hara, about the connection between COVID 19 and Loshan Hara and a slander. This affects the tongue and that affects the tongue all the time, all the time, all the time. But when a person speaks slander, person spills another person's blood and this is it's not apparent because it's not a bullet in the person's head but what it does affects the neshama and the, another person that has slander spoken about him is the shama's bleeding hashem says your brother or your sister's blood is calling out to me that's in the shama and that's a dam when nefesh the torah says that the nefesh it's, it, it's, a, it's in the blood you spill a person's blood even spiritually it is have to be so, so careful, so, so careful. And I said last week, the biggest health insurance against COVID-19 is not to say a word of slander about anyone, about anyone. Someone who's to put you in slander or about this, but don't express things about politicians. Don't talk about politics. And this one's this way, this one's that way. And when someone said, well, I can talk about politicians. Uh, Trump isn't Jewish. Biden isn't Jewish. I can talk about them. No, you can't. The Chafetz Chaim says, if you're used to talking slander about human beings, then someone, a Jew might get on your nerves. Next minute, you talk about Jew, oh, whoa, whoa, that's a big problem. So we accustom our mouths not to talk about anyone. So the Holy Yid explains like this. The Yudi, of, uh, he, he, the book of his Torah teachings is called Beis Yaakov. And Beis Yaakov, and it's on the commentary of, of Torah. When he writes the Beis Yaakov, the tshuva was created before the world. In other words, Shem, when he created his 13 attributes, and Hashem put them into the spiritual potential, they're going to go into the world. Hashem created tshuva because this was the biggest expression of Shem's love and Hashem's mercy, and Hashem's compassion. When a person does wrong, does tshuva. Okay, actually, you, you, you do damage. You, you do damage. Uh, you back into somebody's car. Okay, cars park back into somebody's car, do damage. Okay, and you say to the person, oh, I'm so sorry. 
fix that. Rip, that's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> it's crazy. But tshuva is stronger than all that. Tshuva is so strong, just so long as we're sincere about it. Okay. So he says, since tshuva was created before the world, and tshuva is above nature, and tshuva defies logic, then tshuva overrides nature and overrides logic. Do you know what this means? This is profound. Suppose you have a blockage in your life. You have an obstacle in life. Okay, you get this from people all the time. Rabbi, I can't understand. I'm trying to get uh, a certain job, trying to land a certain job, and I've got all the qualifications. Just doesn't seem to happen. Or a person, say, that's in real estate and he's trying to sell houses or something like that. And he's got he's got the, the best properties at the best price, and it's not happening. Or something else, a person waiting for a shidduch, and it's not happening. He can't understand what is going on. Why he's not getting what he needs? Well, it's a blockage. It's a blockage. It's imagine a big boulder in the middle of Highway 95. A boulder that just you can't what the boulder blocking four lanes. You can't circumvent the boulder. So what do you need? You need a bulldozer to get the boulder out of your way. What's the bulldozer? The bulldozer is chuva. A person does chuva, and a person makes cheshbon nefesh. He makes stock in himself or herself and self assessment. And this moves the blockage because this corrects the blockage of the person. And, and, and what you do, we're going to learn how to do this. And it is so simple. When you learn how simple it is, you're not going to believe it. It, it, it is so simple to, to do chuva. Okay, we're going to learn this right. We're going to learn this also. All right. So the Holy Yid says like this the Midrash says, Mid at the Deen, divine justice. A person can't stand in front of divine justice. That's what we say in Asher Yatsa prayer. Okay, Hashem, if one of our pores or one of our bodily openings opens involuntarily when it shouldn't and closes when it should open, then we can't live. We can't live very long in front of you. Right? So the Elegiyad says, and talk, this is talking about the Neshama. He says, without Shuva, when a person is subject to divine justice, it is impossible to stand before Hashem. But here's what the Yid says, and this is Chidush. He says that if a person makes Shuva, especially during the month of Elul, when Hashem is amongst us, Hashem, the access to Hashem is so easy, Hashem is so accessible. When a person makes Shuva during the month of Elul, Person, you know what it says? He says, Efshal la amod ulikayem lefanecha. Hashem, it is now possible to stand before you. And he brings something, it makes my the hair of my palm stand up. He says that if you look at the initials, Efshal Aleph, Lid Kayem, Lamed, Villa Amod Vav, Lefanecha Lamed, it's the initials of Elul. When the neshama says, Hashem, I can stand before you. Why? The ticket is with tshuva. So, wow. A person, his lack of power and all the blockages in his life, Hashem is a loving father. Hashem wants to give you everything. Hashem wants you to be successful. Hashem wants you to be rich. Hashem wants you to have great shidduch for your kids. Hashem wants you to have great shidduch for yourself. Hashem wants you to have great health. Hashem wants you to have everything. But Hashem needs a vessel for all this divine light. Abundance is divine light. Okay, it all comes from divine light. So Hashem needs a vessel. When a person transgresses Torah, he goes against the vessel. He breaks the vessel. So Hashem doesn't take fine wine and pour it on the floor. It doesn't work like that. Hashem wants a nice crystal goblet, nice clean crystal goblet. When you make chufa, your neshama becomes a clean crystal goblet. And it's a vessel for all types of abundance. And the greatest abundance there is, is getting close to Hashem. When your neshama can feel Hashem in this world. And Hashem lets you know it. Hashem lets you know it. All types of things. Sometimes you see things unnatural. Unnatural. You see a bird that's very much afraid of people. And all of a sudden, that little bird stands right next to you and looks up to you. You're taking a walk in the park. And this little shy bird just looks up to you and chirps, doesn't move. 
They say, what? You're the shy bird. Every time I see you fly away, you can't even. No, the bird's right there with you. That's a Hashem with you. Hashem is showing you my beloved daughter, my beloved son. I'm right there with you. Okay. And so what do we see? You think of, oh, ladies are talking nice talk. Everything I'm speaking is not only Geshe Chaim, not only Hillel Kid, it's in the Gemara. Reish Lokish, who was probably one of the most famous Bali Chuvas of all time. Reish Lokish was a gladiator. And Reish Lokish he jumped across. If he was in the Olympics, today, he would be an Israel champion, broad jumper, gold medal. He could jump across, broad jump across the Jordan River. And then Reb Yochanan saw him, and Reb Yochanan made him do Chuf. And he says, if you do Chuf, I'll let you marry my sister. And Reb Yochanan was very handsome. He said, my sister is much more gorgeous than I am. That's what happened. So Reish Lokish not only made Shuva, he became Reb Yochanan's learning partner. Reb Yochanan is the father of the Yushalmi Talmud. Okay, he's the first generation of Omoraim that with, with Rav and, and Sura and Shmuel and Pompadita and Reb Yochanan Eretz Yisrael. So Reish Lokish was here in Eretz Yisrael. Reish Lokish, from his own experience, says in Yuma 86b that the power of Shuva is so great that if a person makes tshuva out of fear, then he takes his sins and turns them into neutral. What can say the bank manager took the million dollar debt and said, you owe me nothing. But if a person does tshuva out of love, out of love for Hashem, he does tshuva, wants to get close to Hashem, wants to get the blockage out of his life. What's the blockage out of life? The blockage I want to get out of my life is not the blockage that it's, this may be blocking health or blocks the blocking between my neshama and Hashem. That I, my Hashem, if my neshama could feel more divine light, could be healthy, going to be happy, everything is good. And all emotional difficulties, I did psychology can talk from now until kingdom come, but all the emotional difficulties stem from a lack of divine light because the neshama is in the brain and the, all, all the emotions they stem from the brain. But it's in the neshama. When the neshama is lichtic, like they say, the neshama is illuminated. A person feels happy, a person feels fulfilled. That's the whole thing of getting close to Hashem. Getting close to Hashem, tshuva is good for a person's emotional health. It's good for a person's physical health. It's, it's good to get close to Hashem. When you close to Hashem, what do you say? There is no, uh, nothing lacking for a person that fears Hashem. So Reish Lokish says when a person does tshuva out of love, all his transgressions become all his debits become credits. The million dollar debt becomes a million dollar credit. You know what that means? That means that all a person's transgressions when he makes tshuva with love now become credit to his neshoma. He took the million dollars, put it from the minus column into the plus column. It's unbelievable. Side check from the Gemara. Okay. So this is a person's power to move mountains. It's the power of tshuva. And the reason that we haven't plugged into this power is because we haven't properly done tshuva, which we're turning to Shem. So people say, oh, when it's into tshuva, they're reading books that they, you gotta go and, and roll around in an anthill, or if you live in Alaska, go out nude in the snow and roll in the snow. That's, no, 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 that's not in this generation. That's not in this generation. There was a big tzaddik, and his name was Rabbi Avram Danzig, and he lived from 1748 to 1820. Rabbi Avram Danzig wrote an abridged book of code Jewish law. It's called Chaye Odom. There are two abridged codes of Jewish law that are both classic. One is the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, that was by Rabbi Shlomo Gansfri, and one was Chaye Odom by Rabbi Avram Danzig. Rabbi Avram Danzig codified a prayer that we all say on Erev Yom Kippur. And this is called Tfilas Zoha. Before Kom Nidre, you come to Shul about 10, 15 minutes early and you say this prayer. And in this prayer, there is a blueprint for tshuva. It's an easy, easy blueprint. And if you do this, what I'm going to teach you right now in our remaining minutes before we take questions, if you do this, you could do it in your living room. You could do it in your balcony. You could do it taking a walk in the park. You do whatever you want. And you do this during Elul. Guaranteed, guaranteed, you're going to have the best Rosh Hashanah of your life. First of all, you're fulfilling your obligation, Elul. Second of all, you're doing, you're not waiting until Yom Kippur, the 40 days between the first of Elul 
and tell Yom Kippur to do tshuva, and second, get a great judgment on Rosh Hashanah. You can't beat it. it it's a it's a signed check for not a million dollars, for a trillion zillion dollars for the Shoma. And it's going back to the movie and it's re-editing everything. Re-editing, I'm taking all the embarrassing parts out of the movie and re-editing. Okay, here's what we do. Here's what we do. Part of the feeling, now the first, first thing we say, and maybe you want to write this down. Okay, maybe you want to write this down. Point number one, Hashem, I'm sorry for picking the evil rather than picking the good. This is the template for everything. Hashem, I'm sorry for choosing against your will rather than choosing your will. Okay, this encourages us to learn more about a lot. A person can't know what we talk about Loshanara, we talk about slander. A person can't know what slander is if he doesn't learn the halachas. So two weeks ago, we promised in the name of the Manchester uh, the Rav Segal, the, the Manchester Mashkiach, that he promised if a person learns two laws of Lashon Hara a day, he's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. They have every single blessing. Okay. So we apologize to Hashem for choosing evil rather than choosing good. Okay. And we really mean it. We really mean it. If we apologize with lip service, okay, it's correct. Okay, a good person comes. That's true. We do it with our heart. And now we contemplate. What did we do wrong? This is self-assessment. Okay. Second, number two, Hashem, you created me a brain and a heart. Okay. Why did you create a brain and a heart? Hashem, you created me a brain and a heart so that I would have the thought process to ponder you, to think about Torah, to have good contemplations. And instead of that, I thought how I could swindle my partner or how I could do something, get away with doing something that's not right, and this and that. The power that you gave me to move mountains, I used it to shovel sand. Not only that, shoveling sand, okay, that's it. Uh, and shoveling sand, this is the power you gave me. Hashem, you gave me a mind to learn Torah. So what did I do with the Torah that you gave me to learn? I was on Facebook, Facebook chat or Google chat or, or Twitter. This is, okay, that's shoveling sand. But when a person takes that mind to think about, to contemplate about things he shouldn't contemplate, like another person's spouse, how many people, oh, so I'm not doing anything wrong. Just think about another person's spouse. And you look at someone and you say, boy, what would it be like to be married to that person? Much better than my wife, much better than my husband. Wow, that's a bad contemplation. Because Hashem gave you your wife and Hashem gave you your husband for your own good. Hashem knows exactly what's perfect for you. Hashem knows exactly, exactly, exactly what's perfect for you. When you see, I see a lot of you, Bo Hashem, I'm, I'm happy, it's my joy that the, I'm close to many of you, and, and I see couples out there. I can't imagine in the world somebody more befitting for Eli Sheva than Gennady. No, in the world, nothing. What a beautiful couple. I cannot imagine somebody more befitting for David than Denise. If it, if it, if it, if it look like twins, they're both beautiful. I can't imagine one by one. I think about you know, the one the, 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 close to it and your spouse. Or, and you even think about something else. Hashem gave you what's perfect. And if you don't see that your spouse is perfect, you've got to do tshuva. Hashem, you, you're a loving father. You gave me perfect to correct myself. And why am I angry at that spouse? Because I deny what I got to correct in myself. But if I see something wrong with my spouse, I'm just a mirror. I got to correct myself. But when I talk about that, when I elaborate on that, that's what for show and bite. But this example, Hashem, you gave me a heart to love you. And instead of that, I love the New York Yankees, I love Las Vegas, I love Bermuda. No, this is the hardest to love you, the hardest to love my spouse, the hardest to love my children, to bring them up in Torah. Okay, my mind is to use my mind in Torah, use my mind on bettering the world that you put me in Hashem. And I use it the wrong way, I use it the wrong way. Okay, number three, Hashem, you created me eyes. What did you create me eyes for? King David used to pray to Hashem, we see it till him. Gal Hashem, open my eyes so that I may see the wonders of your Torah. Hashem, open my eyes. Okay. You know something? When you look at the, the beautiful mountains in, in Sinai, you're going to go in Sinai and 
wild, wild, wild mountains and you get on top of Mount Sinai, where here we're here, here in virtual Mount Sinai, moving these mountains. And I never forget, it was so moving when back before Sinai got returned to the Egyptians. Usually most of my army service was in, in North and Lebanon Syrian borders, but I had this one six week reserve duty in Sinai and it was unbelievable. And I would take my free time and go up in the mountains right near Mount Sinai and breathtaking scenery right like this. And it inspires you, it inspires you that you can't even, and this was even 1977, this was before I made Shuva, but before I made Shuva, it just, God, what a wonderful world you have. What a beautiful, and, and, and the Nisham is inspired. We use our eyes to see Hashem in everything. We can see Hashem. We don't just look at a leaf. You look at a leaf with your eye and your brain and you see photosynthesis. How can Hashem take light and put it through chlorophyll and out comes sugars to make the plant grow? Unbelievable. Unbelievable what Hashem does with light and water and and, and we contemplate, we contemplate Hashem. This is what we use our brain for. Okay. Hashem gave us eyes to see the wisdom of Torah. And what do guys do? They use their heads like tank turrets to, to look at what they shouldn't be. And what do women do? They notice every little bit of clothing of the other woman, her shoes and her hair do, and her this and that. She compares herself. I suppose to compare yourself to other women. You're the most beautiful woman in the world. If you don't know, wake up. You're not looking right in the mirror. Yeah, no, Hashem created you with your own beauty that nobody else has. You don't have to look at any other woman. You don't have to look at any other woman. Guys, if you don't see how beautiful your wife is, then you're really looking with eyes of flesh and blood, with eyes that are, are shovels in the sand and not bulldozers. So if you get to, the next thing we do is we do assesses of what do we do with my eyes? The next thing we do, number four, Hashem, you created me ears. You created me ears. What have I done, my ears? Uh, one thing that is great, everybody that's hearing the lesson tonight, you could say, when Shem created me, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to, to a lesson about truth, a lesson about This is Bo Hashem, we're all together, learning together. We're doing what we should be with our mind, with our heart, with our eyes, they hear this is purifying. That's the greatest thing about learning Torah together. People would know what learning Torah together is, even if you don't learn any other Torah. If you don't learn any other Torah and you have it once a week and then together with Lighthouse, we strengthen ourselves in the Muna and we hear words of Torah. This is fantastic. It is fantastic. All the more so if a person learns a little bit every day. So, Hashem, you gave me Torah. You gave me ears that I should be inspired by the voice of a of a of prayer and, and, and show that I should listen to good things. I should listen to it instead. What do I do with the ears? Listen to gossip, listen to slander. Is that uh, this is what we type of thing? And there's nobody, the Gamora says there's nobody that gets away clean from this. And the Gamora and Baba Basra, nobody gets away clean. We all have to do chuva for this. We all have to do chuva for this. And it's funny, this week, this week, I took time self assessment and made with tears in my Hashem, help me use my ears the way I should. And help me, I should listen to slander. Boom, 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 boom. It didn't take 10 minutes to finish where I was, didn't intend to, but boom, I heard some kind of slander about another, another Jew. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I was, Shep says, my son, Laser, you got a way to go. Don't think that you did Shuva once ago. This is for me. I'm talking about myself. Okay, got a way to go. Keep on doing it every day. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Say to Hashem, Hashem, help me do better. And I can't promise you that I'm, I'm never going to hear slander again. I can't promise you I'm never going to flush her up, but I can't ask for your help. This Hashem is not asking us to promise him. Hashem is saying, my beloved daughter, my beloved son, how come you didn't ask for my help? This is what Hashem wants. Okay. So number five, we're talking about Lashon Hara with the ears. Hashem, you created me, my entire oral apparatus, mouth, lips, teeth. I need them all for speech. The teeth I need for the consonants and the lips I need for my B and my P and my L I need for my tongue. I need for say L. <laughs> Not only that for eating and drinking, I need it for speech. Hashem, you gave me 
speech apparatus that I should speak complimentary to another person, that I should encourage other people, speak about Amuna, speak about you, and this purifies the world instead. Oh, yo, 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 yo. How many times a day a person thinks that he could talk about a competitor or a nasty neighbor? I think, nah, even if the neighbor is nasty, even the competitor is dishonest. Loshan Hara is telling the truth, slander is the truth. If it's not slander, it's libel, that's shamra, that's something additional, even more difficult. Okay, so we're not supposed to talk that negative about anyone. Negative about anyone. Okay, if it's something happens, a person has a court case in a religious court based in, he's gotta say, he's gotta say the truth. But out in the street, no reason in the world, no reason in the world. And the sixth thing we do, Hashem, number six, you created me hands. What did I do with my hands? What did I do with my hands? A person can do mitzvahs with hands. He can move mountains with his hands. Okay. He can help a little old man, little old lady across the street. Go pretty crazy. But with the people, they go and, and they touch things that they shouldn't touch. And they do things with their hands. Or they make a fist and they hit people. And use it as weapons. Seventh thing, Hashem, you created me legs. What do I do with my legs? Oh, guys. Oh, guys. So the person runs to do transgression. Uh, person, f f person maybe not modest and maybe reveals her legs to someone that she shouldn't do. They say, I'm not going to be approved. Oh, no, I've got to be careful. Got to be careful. We all have to do every, everything and consider what we're doing with our legs. And our legs should carry us to the study hall carries to shul and we should do mitzvahs with our legs. Okay. And then the whole thing, we assess our whole body. This is it. When you do assessment like this, you go from head to toe, you have done perfect tshuva, perfect tshuva. And if you find something wrong, all you do is say, Hashem, I'm sorry I did it. Don't hide it. Hashem, I admit, I hold up to it because King Solomon says, that a person who confesses to Hashem, Hashem comforts them. And he says, Hashem, I'm sorry I did it. And Hashem, help me do better. You don't have to say, I promise to do better. No, Hashem, you help me to do better because we can't do without Hashem's help. And that is the whole thing. It is so simple. Yeah, the eight steps like a pilot before he takes off, he checks his, he checks all, all the different systems, his avionics, he checks the the port engine, starboard engine, he checks his elevator, checks the landing gear, check this, that, check. This way we check ourselves. We check ourselves during Elo like this, perfect chuva. And this is taken, I watered it down, from, condensed it from tefillah zacha. And you'll see, this is the tefillah that we get in shul. You will all say it on Yom Kippur and you'll feel before Kol Nidre, you say this prayer. Wow, yeah, I messed up, but I've been trying to do my best. And that's all that counts. That's all Hashem expects. Hashem does not expect anyone of us to be perfect because we're not perfect. Hashem expects us to try and do our very best. And when we do our best, you know what Hashem's going to do? He is going to move mountains for us. You'll see. Speed our days, Amen. He'll move mountains. He'll bring in gathering the exiles. He'll build Beit HaMikdash, clear all the obstacles building Beit HaMikdash, and bring Mashiach Tzidkenu. With all the big obstacles in that way, can bring us Mashiach, spin our days on main, and you have the very, very best year of your life. Tough Shin, pay Aleph, New Year 5781 on main. God bless. Okay, if anyone wants to ask questions, you're more than welcome. I'll turn my chat on or send chat to uh, Vivian, the Lighthouse Administrator. Thank you so much, Vivian, for everything you do. Can't imagine how much we appreciate you. And it's a big thing. She's so special. And the dedication, she does things. And Vivian, and together with the Michael Ben Melech, the coordinator of the Lighthouse, and we have so much gratitude to them. Okay, everybody, uh, you have questions? Let's see. Okay, if you, want, if you have a question, write it down. And uh, Vivian, if you can, someone wants a question, let, raise your hand, and Vivian will see you. And... You shall unmute you and you can ask a question straight away. Okay. There you go. 
raise your hand. Meanwhile, hello to everybody. Shalom, Rabbi. I have a quick question. With pleasure. How are you? Ah, oh, Kimia, how are you? Baruch Hashem. How are you, Rabbi? Good, wonderful. Fire away. Okay, so question is, um, with King David, the understanding is that Hashem loved him very much. And, you know, I heard that if someone, you know, if, if people are, are pleased with you, then it means that Hashem is pleased as well. But David had a lot of enemies and a lot of the Psalms say how he was running away from the enemies. So how did he know that Hashem loved him? So wait a second, the King David was running away from the enemy? Yeah, like the Philistines. I mean, the, he had, you know, his best, uh, the, the, his advisor, didn't his advisor? Um, now that, that, that's, that is not shot. That's not the, that's not the interpretation, Kimya. Oh. Uh, King David, not that he's running away, he's asking Hashem to deliver him from his enemies, okay? The way King David got, King David was, he was alone, he was unarmed with all the Philistine army, with the king of God, and King David escaped from that, and he said a psalm about that, about making himself uh, insane, made loony, and screaming, and yelling, and Ah, the king of God, he had a daughter who was insane, and King David was yelling, and she was yelling, and uh, King David, they said, get him out of here. I've got enough for one, one crazy person as it is. Okay. But he didn't run away the enemy. Sometimes he used tricks. In fact, King David fiercely fought his enemies. Very fiercely fought. But the enemy he's talking about, he's talking about shit, uh, the enemies of Loshan Hara, all the people that spoke bad against him, spoke behind his back, which is Yetzir Hara. Yetzir Hashem, you take care of him. But King David confronted his enemies. They confronted his enemies. And there's a lot of places, Kimmy, where I can show you this in the hill. Okay. But what he does, he doesn't confront these enemies with the might of the right hand. He says, Hashem, deliver me. Deliver me. Okay. And he does it with tshuva all the time. If you hear King David talk about himself, he thinks that uh, he is the, you think he's the biggest sinner in the world. That's it. King Dave was all the time in Shufa. Okay. Okay, good. Uh Hashem, Hashem. Okay, let's see. Let's see if you private message. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elise. My my pleasure. Uh David Dome says, I find that in Elul, all the things I want to make Shuva for, things I found I was winging against. Hit me with intense power. Is this a common thing? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, here's the thing, David. And what is happening is like this. It's a, an interesting, interesting uh, phenomenon. Okay. When you made shuva, when you made shuva, you took yourself up the spiritual rung. In other words, before you started making shuva, let's say you were at, level 80. And after you made Shuva, you're now up to 85. Okay. So David, can you imagine when you're playing in the UK in the local league and your your football team comes out first in the local league and so now they go in the National B League. Okay. But even the National B League, the games are much difficult. Okay, but they're still good and they win the B Leagues. They go into A League and then they go finally they go uh, up against the Red Devils of Manchester United or Coventry or one of these other teams, and then they lose eight to nothing. Miserable. And they say, oh, we're doing, we're doing, life is terrible. No, no, sir. Uh, you're not terrible. You're a good footballer, but you're playing in a tougher league. You're now in a tougher league. Because of your chuva, you have gone up a spiritual rung. The Yeser tells you, no, you're down. All the things I've been chewing for now, they're hitting me in the face. No, all the things you're chewing for it now, you're not against them anymore. You're in an upper league, okay? And it's the same thing, okay? There's the Mexican league where, da where David Rofi is up against, and there's the English league where David Dome is up against, 
and there's the you know they, everybody's got got they got their own league, you know. But and, and that's it and personally. So the, your tshuva got you higher. You are now closer to Hashem, but the Yetzer isn't going to give it to you on a platter. All right, that's the cool one. This one happens. Why? How can David Melech think he's such a sinner? Moshe Rabbeinu thought he was such a sinner. Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hashem, erase my name from the Torah. Because the closer a person is to Hashem, the more humble a person is, and the more a person thinks he's so. He's somebody who thinks he's Popeye the sailor, you know, boop, boop, and eating spinach and putting his bike. It's far away from Hashem. It's far away from Hashem. Okay, next question. Let me see. Okay, thank you. Uh, Esther Ruth asks, some of the psukim and tilim sounds like cursing others who did bad to King David. Uh, no, it's not like that. King David doesn't hate people. King David hates evil. Okay, King David is cursing evil, not cursing at people. Okay. And this is what is brought in the Gomorrah. It's got in the Mora that and and Bruria, who was the daughter of uh, okay, one the Bruria, the wife of Rabbi Mayor Balanes. Rabbi Mayor Balanes had neighbors who were atheists, agnostics, and they gave him a rough time. Okay. Uh, Bria, who was the daughter of Rabbi Hanina ben Tardion was one of the 10 martyrs who died together with Rabbi Akiva. Uh, Berea said when Rabbi Meir wanted to cuss them, wanted to curse them. And she says, no, that's not what David, King David says. Okay. King David cursed Chatoim, not Chotim. He cursed sin, not sinners. This is what this said what's going on. King David cursed sin and not sinners. Okay. So I hope that answers your question, Esther Ruth. All right, but that's uh, it's, a, it's a fine line. It sounds to English translation like the same thing. It's not at all the same thing. Okay. Uh, hi, hi, Rabbi. It's Cindy Rand. If I could ask a question, I'm sorry to jump in. My pleasure, apologize. Cindy. Good to hear from you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Your your shiurim are always amazing. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask, you're welcome. I wanted to ask a question, and maybe it, it pertains to other people too. How do you do teshuva on procrastination? Good question. Good Thank question. You. Okay, this is this is why I mentioned this during the lesson. I kind of in fleeting mentioned this during the lesson that uh, our sages in Pirkei Avot says that we should have to do teshuva one day before we die. All right, what happens when people procrastinate? Sometimes they miss the train altogether. You know, it's the tortoise and the hare. Okay, one of Aesop's fables. Uh, the tortoise saying he's got plenty of time, plenty of time, and then he loses the race. We do tshuva very simply. Hashem, one of the greatest gifts you gave me is time. And I wasted that time. Hashem, you gave me another day of life. Cindy, we don't take a day of life for granted anymore. Not with COVID. And just imagine, I told someone earlier today, can you imagine if... Last year in Rosh Hashanah, all of a sudden, the angel of death would walk in a shul, barge in a shul, and the way the Zohar describes him, it's really, I don't want to go, to see, it's a really scary description. And the angel of death says, hey, look around people. The person sitting next to you, not going to be here next year. I said, what are you talking about? You think maybe there's somebody in a, in a Halloween costume or Purim costume? No. It's the real thing. And the Yetzer shows that he shows, he tells you what's in your thoughts right now. That nobody could know that. And he goes and tells people, no, no it'd be, it would be really scary. And look at look what happened to us in 5780. Look what happened to us now. Mm -hmm. Someone would tell us you know, how many people would, would be here. I mean, who can, we, we know they can't procrastinate. We cannot take a day for granted. The beginning of COVID-19, we thought it was just old people. And people that have uh, re uh, resuscitation problems and cardiac problems and pulmonary problems. No, not young people also. Young people also. It's no joke. It's no I, joke. I, I agree. I agree with you. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not so much talking about like davening is one. But I'm saying like if you have, let's say, you have to fold the laundry or 
those kinds of things you procrastinate. Like, how do you not procrastinate about mundane things? That's that's more my question also. Oh, mundane things. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about spiritual things. No, no, spiritual oh, things I got you 100%. I'm saying like the, the laundry that has to be folded or, you know, basically. Uh, there are things stuff. that you don't want to do. Things, to, <laughs> things right, that are dragged right. to do. Things are dragged to do, I know. Except, but especially what the, the, the Acer does, the opposite. But okay. Sometimes when the Acer comes and it tells you to be religious, the Acer says, oh, don't fold laundry. This is Elul. Say to Hillary. <laughs> Okay, so then your father, then your, your husband comes home and the house is upside down and the kids come home. There's nothing to dinner. Mom's been saying to him and the house gets turned upside down. The answer also works this way. This reverse the answer. And then as we get first, we, we know that what we have to do, Cindy, your home is a miniature baked amygdash. All right. And just imagine that those clothes you have to fold. Since your home is a miniature bank, make the mikdash ma'at, those clothes you have to fold are the garments of the high priest. When he's got a sacrifice, they're, they're, they're the priestly garments. You're not folding clothes, you're folding priestly garments. Your husband, it keeps Torah, it keeps mitzvahs, and this is what you're doing for him. You know how Deborah became Deborah, Deborah the prophetess? Um, she or Deborah, the wife of Lapidot. They said Lapidot wasn't his real name. I know, it, but they call Lapidot. Lapidot means wicks. Deborah saw that Lapidot, he was a little bit lazy in his service of Hashem. And she wanted to encourage him to go to the, to the Mishkan. And so she would make wicks. She would take wool and she'd twist them and make wicks for the candles and the Base a mikdash, and she'd take them, give them a coin of good old. And her husband would accompany her. That's how she got her husband to go to base a mikdash. And that's how she became Deborah the prophetess. Deborah the prophetess. When she did something little for holiness, to help her husband, Hashem gave her the powers of prophecy. There's not many prophets that had Deborah's ability. <laughs> that's Deborah the prophetess. So you have to understand when you fold the stop and think when you're doing what your job is, your, okay, your job is is keeping a home and then people look at that they you know there's the women's liberation and they the whole domestic thing and you know we all that it, it, this is a piece of meat dush why do women because if a woman listen to also they think they're they, they think they're shovels in the sand like we said in the lesson and not bulldozers at the, your house is a piece of meat dush cindy and and what you're doing is it's like you're preparing for for the corner you, you, you're serving the shim when you're cooking, you're serving a shem, especially with your yeah. shabbos. Yeah. And, and you're in charge of the kashras in your home. And you're in charge of the clothes in your home. The clothes in your home, you can see, see what, what, what your daughters are wearing. It's, it's modest. It's not modest. It's this, that. It's all oh, go through. And you know, wife can control her husband. Uh, husband, this is uh, not exactly what uh, 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 observant Jewish guy should be wearing, this and that. Where'd you get this shirt from? You know, you can, you can control all the thing. A woman, the great thing about it, a woman, she controls the ruchness of her house. So you're not folding clothes. You are coordinating the spirituality of your home. And it's the okay. mindset. Okay. Okay. The great this, analogy. Thank you. Thank you so you much. Know, could you also it, repeat? When you if look you at could it, also repeat, Hashem, Yeah, you're 100%. You're right. A brilliant analogy. If you wouldn't mind repeating that short story you'd said about the bird, I had an internet problem. I didn't hear that. About what, what was that I didn't hear? There was there was a story that you um, related about a small bird. Oh, about a small the... bird. Okay. Yes. Sometimes when Hashem wants to reveal himself to someone, they take a, a, a little bird. Uh, take okay. Israel's national bird is the hoopoe. It's called duchipat. Okay. And this little bird is very 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 bashful. Person gets near the bird, fly right away. So just imagine you're in the park and you're talking to Hashem. And a little hoopoo, a duchipat, comes right next to you and looks up at you and doesn't run away. This is not, not natural. This is not natural. This happened to a young lady in South Dakota, not even Jewish. I told her she could talk to a shem and this and that. And she went out, she, she never grew up to believe in a shem and told her what to do. And she cried her eyes out for three hours. Shem, if you're real, you're real. Shem, reveal yourself to me. And in North Dakota and South Dakota and Manitoba, 
in Winnipeg, they have the, in the prairie, that's out in the Midwest prairie, they have in the, the province of Manitoba and the two states of North Dakota and South Dakota, Google it, Spar star spangled gopher. There's a little gopher that has stripes and spots on his back, it's called star spangled gopher. This gopher is super shy, super shy. And it sees a person, jumps right in the hole. Gophers, they dig holes in the ground, jump right in the hole. Well, this girl out in Dakota, she went in a cornfield. You go in a wheat field, the cornfield is miles, miles long and straight, isn't there? And she's talking to Hashem. And she said, after three hours of talking to Hashem, Hashem, if this is real, reveal yourself to me. And all of a sudden, a little gopher came out of the ground and smiled at her, and stood on his hind legs, and went right back in the ground. And then she broke out crying for another hour. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So that's, that's the story about a little bird. Sometimes you'll see, you can see a sham in everything. You praise him in, in everything. That, that was a story I told about the little bird. Okay. I added the Star Spangled Gopher now. If we're talking about the bird. That's another one of my favorite stories. But the, a young lady in, in uh, I forgot whether it's North Dakota or South Dakota, but it was in the Dakotas. Okay. Time for one more question. Time for one more question. I uh, just want to mention something before you know that during the 10 days of penitence, uh, I'm sure Michael Ben Mel and maybe they're going to advertise it separately. We are going to have a special lesson, a special lesson with, uh, you know, a lot of you, I see the Miami contingent. Okay. I Elaine and I Gennady and Elisheva. And uh, let's see who else I saw. I saw someone else from Miami. We're going to have the Sephardi rabbi of Miami, the esteemed Rabbi Yosef Galamidi. And uh, we're going to be together during the 10 days of Tshuva, and we're going to do a, a, a Zoom together right here, Baruch Hashem, from Florida, virtual Florida, virtual Eretz Yisrael together, and uh, we've got good things planned, good things planned. Okay, if there's one more question, and not, let's see what's going on here in the chat. Okay, uh, hello to everyone. Hello to everyone. Take it as if uh it's a personal hello okay thank you very much from Yoshua. thank you yael and my my pleasure cindy okay elise it's my pleasure good to see you here and ezra thank you too david esther ruth javier wonderful ariel khan Hashem, and everyone Ed, so good becky becky Ed, good to see you and let's see i don't know if I have all the names. Oh, Rapids and Story from New York. Isaac Nicholas Cruz and uh, Becky said hello. Uh, Brother Zizi from Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, it's a great delight to see you. Eileen from Miami. Ariel Kohana, Ezra, Rita Jano, Shirley Benun. Uh, Brother David in London. Brother David in Ciudad de Mexico. Oh, good to see you, Paula, Courtney. Elise, once again, every single blessing to the staff at the Lighthouse, Cindy, Kimya, and uh, Alan and Elisheva and Gennady. So glad to see you. And then it was a delight for our people on Facebook Live that I don't see who they are, but we know you're with us. Hashem should bless you with a wonderful month of Elul and good preparations for Rosh Hashanah and all your hearts with the best with great El, great Parnassah and every single blessing you need. And Ruchnis and Gashmi is much abundance. God bless. We'll see you. Peace out to next week. Bye-bye.